Okay, so before, well, we're going to read, are we going to read? No. We're going to do a review of the background stuff for Acts real quick before we read chapter 3, which is where we're at. So just to talk about, not so much about how Acts was published, I don't think we have to review that, but we will talk about um, personality and um, the culture of the first century. Because some stuff we're going to encounter in Acts, we're just going to kind of go, huh, that's weird. And for them, our society would be extremely weird. Uh, so we'll just uh, bang through a little bit of this uh, before we begin tonight. Because it's going to come to bear, especially as we start talking about individual events and things that happen other than preaching. Uh, especially when we get to the story of uh, Ananias and Sapphira, which is like, ah, you know. It's like, well, yeah, yeah. But in that culture at that time, it made sense. It does not make sense to us. And so this few few thoughts will show us why. So the first thing to remember is the worldview of the people in the first century is completely different from ours. Um, we live in what would be called uh, postmodernism, or I would say meta-postmodern. Now, which meta postmodernism means post postmodern. So, postmodernism means you, ha you can have your truth and I can have my truth, and you have to acknowledge my truth is valid and I have to acknowledge your truth is valid, even if we don't believe it. You know, it's like your, your beliefs are yours, my beliefs are mine, but you have to acknowledge that my, I have the right to have my beliefs and that they are as valid as yours, which is nonsense. And it says there's no absolute, like Pilate said, what is truth? Well, the postmodern says there is no absolute truth. It's all squishy and fluid, uh, which to the people of the first century would be abhorrent. I mean, they would just go, what, stup what stupidity is coming out of your mouth? You're crazy. They need to go chain you up someplace. Now, the post-postmodern world where we're in right now And the movement in art, and art for some reason, art movements trigger or, or are the first visible identity of these movements in culture. You know, just like expressionism identified a movement that was also taking place in society. There is a movement in art called the New Sincerity, uh, which is based on this idea of meta postmodernism, which basically means, oh, we have to take things back, and it's like, oh, we're going to get rid of this, you know, no absolute truth stuff. We're going to dial it back to something real. No, 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 no. They take it to the next level of stupidity where there's no way to validate anything. So basically you are literally an army of one. Whatever you know, your little bubble universe is, is your reality and your reality and your reality. And sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't, and that's okay. Which means you can't have a conversation about anything because nothing means anything. So we'll see how that one shakes out. All of this would be completely foreign. This is what happens when a culture it doesn't have to fight to survive like our ancestors did. You know, you had to like everything was like food, shelter, raising your kids. Now we have time on our hands, so we have time to think up the stupid stuff. That's my opinion. Okay, in the first century, life was simpler. All right. First off, everybody, uh, and you would say life in the first century would be pre-modernism. Uh, I would I would go as far as to say, yeah, pre-modernism, which isn't bad, uh, because with modernism came doubt in the supernatural. Uh, in the first century, everybody understood the super under everybody believed in the supernatural. Whether you were pagan, Jew, Christian, everybody understood there is some force outside us that made all this. It didn't just happen, except for a few Greek philosophers. That there's some power, there's some outside force that governs the universe. And that uh, you are not the most important thing in that universe, which is the biggest difference between our contemporary society and theirs. Uh, and the, the problem we have in, in understanding that culture is in the 21st century, especially in the United States, our focus is on solving problems, right? There's a problem and you fix it. And the only one that's going to fix it is you. I have a problem, I fix the problem, and 
uh, then by that I validate and, and discover my own individual potential, right? It's the American dream. It's pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, achieving things, and you do it with no outside help. Uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, looks at things that today, eh, they're getting a little, people don't like that, uh, particularly gender-specific values. You know, like women had roles, men had roles. It wasn't bad, that's what they did. It's what God created them to be, male and female, they created him. You know, we found, Adam found, like we heard last week's uh, Sunday's Old Testament reading, you know, and God wanted Adam to not be alone and to have a helper fit for him, and there was nothing that he'd made yet was good, uh, so he made a woman. And now together, the two of them become one, and they go out into the world and do stuff. Uh, so you have gender-specific values, which mm -mm, don't like that today. Uh, there is an a idea of public public reward and public honor back then that we don't necessarily want today. I mean, people still want recognition, but there was a deep concern for people to have a public recognition of, of what they did to receive honor based on a status system that was deeply rooted in society. So there was definitely levels to society. You didn't really try to get out of yours, move to another one. It's just you did as good a job as you could where you were, and that contributed to society as a whole, uh, which we don't think of today as, oh, we have to fix everything. And it's not necessarily that their way is better and our way is wrong, but it's different. You know, you never, no one would have thought of like trying to climb up from, you know, from, from rags to riches. Again, that's like the American dream. It's like, okay, our grandparents came to these shores, right, from the old country, and they didn't have anything, and they didn't speak English, and within a year, they all spoke English, they all had a job, they all saved their pennies so their children could have it better than they did, and the next generation could have it better than they did, and now we're going backwards, probably. Uh, but that idea was foreign to them. It's like, well, if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for you, but it contributes to society. That was the first century way of thinking. So, and that status system that was ingrained into their personality, into their society. So closest way we could think of this to something current would be to look at uh, tribal life in, say, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where everybody contributes to the tribe. They each have a job to do. Everybody has to do the job, and together, as a whole, they prosper. But everybody has to pull, everybody has to do their job. Uh, there's no individuality, like somebody doesn't aspire to become chief and then they begin a political career, right? Okay, that, that's not how that works. So that's the way that worked back then. Or you could look at the only thing someone in the first century would have that looks remotely like what we do is what the Romans do. So we'll, we'll, I'll come back to that. I don't want to hit that quite yet. All right, so the Mediterranean world of the first century had very traditional, very stable social structures. Individualism was a completely foreign idea. Okay, there was no idea of uh, being a self-perceived, distinctive individual in your social group. Instead, you were a... Uh, you were a distinctive whole set within another group of distinctive wholes uh, within a given social and um, natural background, so your location and your social level. So they thought socially. They did not think uh, psychologically, which is what we do. Okay, And that's called a dyadic. They perceive their role and their status in the clan, in the family, and within themselves, as being ordered by God. Okay, So God puts you in that role, and that's where you work, which we kind of do that with our idea of vocation. Wherever we are, that's what we do. Uh, but we don't talk about aspiring to do other things. But it's the idea of vocation. You have a vocation, and you stick to it. 
Uh, and then we also have to understand how important the role of uh, honor and shame and morality and deviance and value and virtue back then were. Uh, the idea of honor and shame, something you can do can honor your group, is something you can do can shame the whole group and yourself. Uh, you can be moral, have good morality, or you can be a deviant, which becomes exclusionary. They don't want deviants. You shuttle them someplace else. Uh, do we have that today? Still, sure. But this was defining of society. A lot of that's more acceptable today. What's that? The, the deviant. Oh, deviance. Yeah, yeah the deviant, the, deviance the is... And, and the shame. Yeah. People yeah, dev- today have no shame. Yeah, deviance is a virtue today. So we blurred those lines that were so concrete back then. Uh, and it's important for us to realize, because then when you look at them looking at the Romans, so say they look at the Romans, and even in the Mediterranean, they're still, still part of the Roman Empire. Rome rules the civilized world at this time. So the idea that these Romans have this thing called the, cur- the cursus honorum, uh, a young man that aspires to political uh, uh, status because he comes from a good family, one of the patrician families, starts when he's young with his education, and then starts climbing the ladder. That's what this cur- cursus honorum is, the ladder of honor. And you start at the low level of government and you start working your way all the way up to consul and then eventually proconsul. And in the later empire, like they are in the first century, you know, emperor. Uh, that idea is completely foreign to these people. They're like, they don't understand what these Romans are doing. Like, why would you do this? Um, so you can have a, a some contrasts about the way they look at things. So in... You know, in America today, we like we do things. Okay, in the first century in the Mediterranean, they simply are. They're dedicated to being. We are dedicated to doing, right? Because it's what we do that identifies us, not who we are. Uh, relationships in the first century are collateral, as opposed to America today, which is individual. It's always about the group not the individual. Uh, Time is focused on the present as informed by the past in the first century. Today, it's all about the future being informed by the here and now, which is a big difference. Um, And then as far as man versus nature in the first century, men are subordinate to nature. Now we are the masters of nature, or we try to be. Uh, And then human nature, back then, you have, you know, mixed human nature, but you also have evil. Uh, In contemporary America, it's kind of neutral. Human nature is neutral. It's what you, it's the labels we put on everything. Is anything truly evil or truly good? Fun fact, the word natural, or I'm sorry, not natural, the word neutral is not found in the Bible. There is no such word as neutral found in the Bible which is interesting. So, just throwing that out there. Uh, And then the word city also meant something different. Um, You know, we talk about a city today. Well, maybe it's a little different. City back then did mean something different, but it had, a city had sharply defined areas of distinct social status and expected behavior in that place, in that in that area. Uh, so if you had a certain social status, you didn't kind of leave your area of the city. So you had, you know, the uppity part of town where all the richy riches are, and the richy riches stayed there, and the poor people stayed over here in their part of town, and they didn't leave that part of town. So everything they did took place in that part of town, and you didn't mix it up. Do we have that today? Not to that degree. We still have social stratification in, in cities and so forth, and then suburbs and and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, it was different different back then. And let's see. Probably don't have to talk about Luke's audience anymore. 
Um, Luke, well, I'll mention really quickly again, Luke's, oh, in Mediterranean society, one of, uh, one of the most crucial issues in Mediterranean society in the first century uh, was rank and status. Uh, so even epitaphs on, on tombs and things would suggest that there were uh, folks of lower rank could still celebrate their status within their group of their peers. Uh, and they looked for self-assertion, kind of like we do today, but they had a definite feeling of inferiority to the next class up. They didn't aspire to get to that. They just felt, okay, I don't, this is where I belong. I cannot aspire to getting to the next rung on the ladder, so to speak. Uh, social mobility was uncommon except uh, people who had previously been slaves and became free, or people who were newly wealthy, namely merchants. That's how you got new, you know, the nouveau riche back then. Uh, so like the old money, they're at the top of the food chain already. Um, but you didn't have people who like worked themselves up from the gutter and became upper class citizens. It just didn't happen. Uh, so the only time you saw people moving out of their social group was freedmen and um, ur urban merchants who became wealthy through trade. What about Joseph? How does he fit in there? Joseph? Yeah. Like Jesus' dad? Uh, no. His um, stepdad or Joseph from the Old goats? Testament? Yes. The yeah, Old Testament. Different different era entirely. I'm, I'm, okay. you know, I'm talking about the first century. Uh, yeah, Joseph, yeah, that's different. That's completely different, but that's God's plan, too. I mean, that was, mm -hmm. you know, custom-tailored God's plan, so that's the big difference. But yeah, that's that's a big, that would be rare. I mean, that's why, it's huge, such yeah. a, that's why it's such a huge story is because look at how unusual that would be, right? That someone would come from, you know, a tribe like that and then wind up, like, running Egypt. Mm -hmm. That's kind of unheard of. Same thing with Moses, actually. Uh, so yeah, so that social mobility was very, uh, very much uncommon. Luke's audience uh, pretty much looks like it would be urban, Greek, uh, probably f officially Romanized cities like Corinth and you know, like uh, Philippi. Uh, most of his original intended audience when he was writing it. Um, would have some measure of education. Uh, they would understand at least part of parts of Jewish religion, um, and they would understand some philosophy, even if they did not have any formal training in any of that stuff. Uh, but then, of course, his wider audience is the Christian Church at large, and that's not as important as understanding what society was like. Uh, but the other, the one point about who they are would be, uh, there's a couple points actually. Uh, they would know Greek, which is not as important, but uh, if you notice Luke in, in Luke and Acts gives all the Greek coin titles. Uh, he uses Greek words in his text, so it's a, a Greek speaking audience and he wrote it in Greek. Uh, so they are probably, his Jewish audience is probably, these are diaspora Jews. So these are Jews from the great diaspora where they all kind of, Jew, Judaism is all over the place now. Uh, so these are Jews uh, scattered, which of course we see that with the whole story of Pentecost and how the Christian church gets started. Uh, and they're attracted to Judaism. They know the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is what the apostles quote in the New Testament, they are quoting the Septuagint. Jesus quoted the Septuagint. That's why we mentioned this before. That's why if they quote the, New, the Old Testament in the New Testament and you look it up in our Old Testament, it doesn't match because our Old Testament is translated from Hebrew and they're quoting from the Greek. And that's why that is. Uh, and they would know a lot about pagan religions and they would be put off by it. They, like, they don't like it. And so they would know 
they would know some things about Judaism, they'd be attracted to it, but they would know details, like they would know the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee. Uh, but they would know the Bible quite well. They would know the Jewish scripture quite well, even if they don't know Jewish traditions that came after the writing of scripture. And that's probably enough of a review of that stuff. So that's all stuff we have to keep in mind, that this, this idea of, of what society was like, what an individual felt like within that society, how different it is from our culture today. Because that helps us understand some of the stranger things we read in the New Testament at, in, at large, but particularly in Luke's writing. So let us go ahead and look at Acts chapter 3. So, Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man came uh, from his mother's womb, was, oh, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And I'm reading an old King James, so the language is going to be a little weird. Uh, but it's got some interesting differences. That's why I'm using it. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting them to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lift him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the, same, the lame man which was healed held Peter and John all, and as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering and when Peter saw it he answered unto the people ye men of Israel why marvel ye at this or why look ye to so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob the God of our fathers have glorified his son Jesus whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name made this man strong, whom ye see and know, Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did all also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has fulfilled. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto all of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say to you, and shall come to pass that Every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And there's a there's a couple interesting differences with the old the old King James and 
our newer translations. You said that it's at the 1668? Yeah, this is, what is it? 1698. 98, okay. Because yeah. it's really close. I mean, yeah, there are It's some very close, yeah. But it's very close to what we have, so I think that's kind of impressive. And this is, where did it come from? Yeah, and this is English. It was printed in London. Uh, it was an official Church of England publication. It's got a copy of the Book of Common Prayer in it and like two complete translations of the Psalms in addition to the copy of the Psalms that's in the Old Testament. It's a neat, kind of a neat book. Okay, so a man lame from birth was being carried that they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate. We don't know which gate that is, by the way. Uh, they have some ideas. Um, they, they say that's one, one of two gates, but they're not entirely sure. Uh, to ask alms of those entering the temple. So in, in Jewish law, uh, one of the big you know, things that people are supposed to do is take care of the poor. You know, that was one of the you know, redeeming qualities of Judaism as much as they drifted away from other things, but taking care of the poor, giving to the poor freely was a valued virtue. Um, and so his friends put him by the gate there to beg for alms for people going in the temple because that's a good place to get people in it, finding them in a charitable way, right? And they saw Peter and John about to go into the temple and he asked, uh, he asked for them to uh, give him some. And Peter looked at him and did John and said, look at us. And he looked at them, expecting to get something. And Peter says, I don't have any silver or gold, but I do have, I have is like better than silver and gold. Right in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Took him by the right hand, raised him up. And all of a sudden he couldn't not, not just only walk, but he could run and jump and, right, and praising God. And everybody saw him doing this. And they all recognized who he was. And they were filled with wonder and amazement because signs and wonders, right? Just like when Jesus did it. People like the signs and wonders. And again, that's why the apostles are able to do these things. Because, oh, hey, yeah, we were with Jesus. We saw him raised from the dead. Well, how can we trust you? Well, we can do all the same stuff he did, right? They can heal. They can raise the dead. They can do all the things Jesus could do, which gave authority to their claim that, yes, we saw him raised from the dead. Okay, and they're in Solomon's portico. And then Peter sees, hey, there's a bunch of people here. This is a good time to preach. So he does. Why are you wondering at this? And why are you looking at us as if we're the ones that did this? And then, you know, he recites the formula, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. Glorified in, what, what do you guys have in your, in your translation? ESV has servant. Witness. Uh, verse 13. Servant Jesus. Servant Jesus, right. I think what you read said son. Mm -hmm. son. It, it did. The King James has son and that's a better translation. It's the word uh, pedion, which is where we get the word pedophile, pediatric. It's child, son. Uh, so yeah, in, in the masculine form it is son. So, yeah, it's not servant, it's son. Um, so why or change? child. Hmm? Why change? It, it can be translated as servant. It's not wrong, but it's not the best translation. But it feels bad. I mean, Jesus was the servant of God. Well, he was, because when you actually, if you look at Luke's gospel narrative, the whole narrative of the suffering servant, and also did, Matthew, well, okay. you know, he took on the form of a servant. Uh, you know, the one, the one who wants to be first must be last. He must be a servant okay. of all. Uh, so that servant translation isn't wrong. It's just son is better. <laughs> I think well, son is better. It says that, it, that, it, that term was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 52. Hmm. That's, what, that's what my footnote says. So probably they just carried it over. No, just a curious curiosity, what does our Isaiah 52 say? 52 verse, well, goes all the way 
verses 13 to 53. Behold, my servant shall not be Oh. Ah, but ours is translated from Hebrew, not Greek. Yeah, but it says servant. Yeah, probably. I, I'm curious what the Greek says, but I don't have one with me. Oh, oh. yeah, I do have one on my phone. So Isaiah 52, 13. Behold my servant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just out of curiosity, if we look at the Greek Old Testament... Isaiah. Well, they could have clarified it and said his servant Jesus, God's son. Mm. <laughs> and all the bases. Yeah, but, yeah, that would have done it. Man, which is you know my son. That's got the same root, but but yeah, you can translate. Like I said, you can translate it as servant. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, I like I like the way the King James has it. That that's that's a better one. You know, and it um, that happens a lot too when you check like the old King James and you check it with Luther's Bible, and they are often. When there's a little word translated differently, Luther usually is on board with the different reading. Um, that happened with last Sunday's um, gospel reading. Actually, if you look at um, look at your Bibles at what was that Mark ten? Yeah, turn your Bibles Mark Mark ten. This is probably a good object lesson, even though it's not about what we're talking about, but. This is the fun stuff, I think. Whoever causes one of these little ones to sin, it's better if he had a big millstone put around his neck. Now, look at your verse numbers. 42, 43, 45, 47, 48, 49, 50. Okay, so verse 46 and verse 44 are not there, but I bet. 44 and 46? No, they're not. Why? Uh, because it is traditionally believed now that uh, each of those two missing verses are the ones that said where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It's repeated three times in this passage. And that's the other two places it's repeated is at verse 44 and verse 46. And it's traditionally believed now that those were scribal additions. You know, they were added to the text that they didn't actually belong there originally, so they take them out. Uh, which you probably there's probably a footnote. I was looking for it and I didn't see it. Yeah, some manuscripts add verses 44 and 46, which are identical with verse 48. <laughs> now, the Luther Bible has all three of those verses, and the King James has all three of those verses. But, like, our new modern translation does not have it because they think it was a later scribal edition. Maybe. You know, at least they don't hide it. They put you a footnote that just says, oh, this is what it says, you know. Actually, there's a so footnote in the study Bible. No, there's some. It is up in the text. So it's going to be up there somewhere. Oh, it's right below. It's right. It's yeah, see, those are the. This is the book. Lutheran study Bible notes, but these notes at the bottom up here, those are the actual ESV translation notes. So you've yeah, got two I sets. You got two sets of notes in these Bibles. So that's a, that's an actual from the that's the notes from the ESV translator saying this is why we did this. So it, it just took out a lot of repetition with what the verse no. 48 said. I'll turn back a page. Yeah. yeah. So it was in the footnotes for 
I'll read. Can you, you got to get your copy. I was going to say it's in the footnotes from the sermon I wrote on it. I have it in a footnote. Uh, yeah, so when you see stuff like that happen, it's because translators make these decisions. Uh, well, translations are all done by committee uh, anymore because they kind of have to be so that one individual's bias doesn't come through. Uh, Luther did not. He translated the New Testament on his own. Uh, and then he did the Old Testament himself with help. He, you know, he didn't do that one-man show, which took like four times longer than the New Testament did. Uh, but his New Testament translation, and I say this in every Bible study at some point, you know, I'm not going to say that Luther's translation of the Bible is divinely inspired, but boy, it's close, because regardless of all the manuscript evidence that's been discovered since he did it, when you take that into account and look at his translation again, his translation's still right. I mean, the guy was a genius and obviously had, I'm not going to say it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was in the room when he's doing this stuff. I mean, it's a very, very good, very good translation that holds up to this day. Uh, it's excellent. So when Luther makes a decision, I kind of side on his side because he's a smart fellow. So I, that, and I use, I actually use his translation a lot, uh, just as a double check or as a parallel. I've always got it open somewhere, uh, just because his language is so simple, uh, and sometimes it's clearer than our English translations are. But anyway, enough about that. So I just think it's interesting when you see like phrases omitted or verse number. Like every now and then, you'll notice a verse. If you, you don't notice it, because we don't like actually go verse one, verse two, verse three, you'll see all of a sudden verses are missing. They're not missing, but they make editorial decisions, and so you'll have. Like in that case, that was one of the big ones where there's like two whole verses missing in a pericope. Uh, that different translations still have them. Ours is there. Yeah. Verses is there. yours there? Is, is that a. No, King James. It's King James. See? So it's based on King James, right? And then all of the like authorized standard version and all of those will have it in it too. Because they're You're all based on. Verse 45 is missing? No, 44 and 46. It's in 48. The 44 and 46 yeah. are missing. I have 44 in mine. What translation are you using? NIV. Oh, okay. And 48, did you say? I didn't say 46. 44 and 46. 44, 44, 45, 46. Oh, okay. Yeah, it depends. 47, 48. So whenever ever you come across where there's verses missing, or scare quotes, missing, uh, there's usually reasons for it. And I think there's one or two occasions that it's just misnumbered and they have to keep it that way or everybody's Bibles would be screwed up. So like somebody accidentally skipped a verse and you have to carry that through. I think that happens once and I don't remember where it is, of course. But yeah, every now and then you'll find that where there's Verse numbering confusion. Okay, well, enough about that. Okay, so glorified his son, Jesus, whom you delivered over. You know, so he is still railing against the Jews themselves. You know, you delivered over, you delivered over, and denied in the presence of Pilate. When he had decided to release him, which is which is true, I mean, Pilate wanted to let him go. He didn't want anything to do with any of this. They're like, well, you know, I got to keep the peace. I think it's interesting how Peter then softens his admonition of the people, so he doesn't totally yeah because alienate mean, them. Yeah, he doesn't do that with like the. Pharisees or the Sanhedrin. But when he's talking, but when he's talking to the people, it's like, hey, hey, this is the result of what you did. But hey, guess what? All right, so you denied the holy and righteous one, asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life. So, uh, you know, it kind of drives some of the fact. Okay, this Jesus who you killed, do you realize who he is? 
know, and, and I think sometimes when we read it, we read it as, hey, you guys killed Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of life. He is the son of God, and you killed him. It's like, I don't think that's the emphasis he's preaching. You guys might disagree, but I read, when I read Peter saying this, he goes, hey, you guys killed Jesus of Nazareth. Do you know who he is? Not you killed him because you knew who he was. It's like, you killed him. Do you realize he is the son of God, the author and perfecter of faith? And now he's going to preach the gospel. So they, they denied him. They, all the signs were there. All the wonders were there. All the miracles were there. He told them who he was. They didn't believe. They killed him. It's like, well, hey, guess what? Everything he said is true. You killed this Jesus of Nazareth, who, as he said he was, is the son of God. And God raised him from the dead. Okay, yeah. so you killed the author of life. And God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses to this. We were there. We saw it happen. Okay, and his name, faith in his name, made this guy who you see every Sabbath when you go into the synagogue, this guy you've seen here laying on a mat, that name, faith in that name is who made him well. And now that perfect health has been restored to him in your presence and your witnesses to it. That's kind of neat. So this Jesus, who you crucified, who you didn't listen to, by the way, he was the son of God and God raised him from the dead and we saw it happen. And that name of that guy you killed, who God raised from the dead, faith in that name, healed this guy that you see and you saw it happen. You know, we're witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Now you're witnesses to the power of faith in that name, who God raised from the dead. That's a pretty powerful, pretty powerful sermon right there. And then now he, like he says, he softens it. Now, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. I mean, he kind of, he's not letting them off the hook. It's like, because ignorance is not innocence, right? But you acted in, ignorant, in ignorance, as did your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. There was something I wanted to say about Luke. What was it? Right. I'll get to him. Okay, so now he's appealing to their knowledge of the scriptures, right? All the things the prophets foretold. Hey, this guy, Jesus Christ, this man, who is also the Son of God, he fulfilled all those prophecies. Okay, all of these things have been fulfilled, therefore. In parentheses, he's the Messiah, therefore, repent. Repent, turn back to the Lord that your sins may be blotted out. Uh, that times of refreshing may come. That phrase, times of refreshing, is neat. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Boy, that's a long sentence. Okay, so a time of refreshing is what says that new mouth. That's a strange word that I can barely pronounce. Anna, anaphysios, anaphysios, anaphysios. So, uh, breathing space. So, breathing room. Uh, the time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. 
Uh, it, it's a time that's supposed to be free from, the Lutheran Study Bible note is uh, a time free from end times distress, which is not a helpful note at all, because what does that mean? Uh, repent that your sins may be blotted out, that times of this breathing room may come. Um, so you don't have to worry at the end? Yeah, I think that's what it's getting at. It's like, okay, turn and repent the so guilt. that so that you're... The guilt that yeah, they say that's a good feeling. way to put it, I think. Yeah, I'm not... I'm trying to come up with it. I think you're right. That's the best way to say it. Is I'm trying to ex explain what I'm th thinking up here, but I can't get the words out. So this breathing space is the, like, turn from your sins... Repent so that so that the, the Christ may enter in, that the anointed one may enter you, so that you have breathing room, that you can you can take a breath from the dread of the last day, so that you have assurance that it's like okay, you can breathe easy. Your sins are forgiven. Repent, your sins are forgiven. So you can breathe easy. Despite what you see, and I'm, this is all implied, despite everything they see going on around them. Because don't forget, the world is pretty not good right now, right? So this is uh, still 33, 34-ish, 35, 36, somewhere around there. Um, the persecution's coming. The big persecution is coming in, in you know another decade or so. So he's urging the church to turn to Christ to, to receive that forgiveness of sins so when it gets really bad, they have this breathing room before that bad time comes. It's going to test all their faith. And also uh, that they can have that assurance. They don't have to worry about when the last day comes or their day of their death comes. Okay, So that he may send the Christ uh, whom heaven must receive. Till the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of the prophets. So that's talking about the last day, right? The time of restoring all things. So the things, our internal restoration begins by his death and resurrection. Faith in his death and resurrection is applied to you in baptism, right? The benefit of his death and resurrection is applied to you in baptism uh, when you become a child of God. And then the beginning of your restoration starts. So you have uh, the old Adam daily having to be drowned. Okay, he's drowned and he comes back the next day and he's drowned and he comes back the next day. That's the baptized life until it's completely restored on the last day at the resurrection. And then it's the good work begun in you is completed. Uh, the same thing with the world. The world will be unmade and remade the way it was before the fall because that affected the creation as well. It wasn't just we fell into sin. The whole world was corrupted by that. Um, so all of that brokenness will be restored. Uh, and then he talks about, you know, appeals to Moses, which makes sense. You know, he is talking to a, a Jewish audience. He's going to appeal to the patriarchs and the prophets and especially to Moses. You know, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You'll listen to him and whatever he tells you. And of course, Moses was literally speaking about who? When he said that, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me. Well, he's speaking about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So, a uh, prophet like me, but not like me. And every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. That's another strange phrase. Destroyed from the people, cut off from the people, which was in you know Judaism that was getting cast out. That was bad, right? I mean, you might as well. It's worse than death. You know, you have to live with that shame, with that being cast out of society. Excommunicated, basically. You know, like, you know, who's the big object lesson of that from way back in the Old Testament? Like, way, way back. Like Genesis. Oh, you mean getting thrown out of gar the garden? Of no, no, no. Not Cain, that far back. Cain. Cain. Right, so Cain's cast out. So he had to be separate from all 
whole humanity, oh. which all humanity is not that many people at that time. But so, you know, Cain, you know, said that's more than I can bear, right? That was his, like, you might, just kill me. Because I the, because everybody's going to be looking to kill me. They're going to know, they're going to know who I am. So that's why he put the mark on him, not as a punishment, but as a protection. Okay. So and I think it even harkens back to that. Uh, so that idea of being cut off from the people. I always want to know where Nod was. No, no. The land of the land of Nod. And he's just repeating about the about the prophets. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Yeah. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. I have a life of its own, my apologies. Yeah, football just came on by itself. No, no, or, it was. What is that? Baseball. Baseball. baseball? Oh. White Sox. I was listening for Paul. Oh. So that first, what do you make of verse twenty-six? God, having raised up His servant, sent him to you first. Well, they rejected him. He was sent for the people, and they rejected him. Mm -hmm. But God, having raised up His servant, is He talking about His having raised up His servant? This is my this is my son, who I sent in the world to do this. Or is it having raised up His servant, raising him from the dead? Which do you think He's talking about here? Oh. Okay. Um. Not really lost. Uh, our verse twenty six is that what did you, mm -hmm. for you first. God raised up His servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. So the servant is Christ. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. But when is he talking about when? God having raised up His servant and sent him to you first? Right. Was he, you know, I will raise up a prophet like Moses, like Moses said, God will raise up a prophet like me. So is he talking about sending Jesus into the world? Or is that from after he's raised from the dead? That's the question I'm asking. I think it's after he's raised from the dead. So which we think of it? And how can we... Does it really matter? Because either way, that was his purpose. True. Whether you decide it was from birth that he raised him up, and the, the three years or so that Christ was on earth trying to convince people to change from their wicked ways or... Good, Marilyn. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. So we could interpret that a couple of ways based on... kind. This is the, the reason I'm going through this exercise is not because I think there's a right answer. I think there's a right answer, but I'm not going to say it. Because like I said, it doesn't matter. And I think you could interpret it both ways from context. So he could be talking about God raising Christ from the dead, or he could be talking about God raising, raising up his servant, raise, like he raise, Moses says, he will raise up a prophet like me. So it could be sending him into the world. Either way, the end result is the same. He sent him first to you, the Jews, and that's the emphasis of the opening chapters of Acts is the birth of the church in Jerusalem. So God sent him to you, my people, you, my chosen people. I'm sending him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you away from your wickedness. Uh, but some people didn't get the memo, right? They didn't. They didn't. They saw it. They didn't believe it. But the opportunity was there because God wants all people to be saved. He wants all people to come to faith. Right? You know, so sometimes we can't figure out exactly what it's supposed to mean, but it doesn't change what it means. You know, we can we can define something one way or another, but the end result of either one of those interpretations is the same result. Um, so as long as we don't come up with a result uh, that's contrary to anything else, we're good. 
But that's the problem we run into with biblical interpretation sometimes is, I mean, people take the stuff completely out of whack and run with it, and it's just wrong. But sometimes, you know, like we're told when you're reading and you get to a difficult passage, okay, and this isn't necessarily difficult, but, you know, you're supposed to use scripture to interpret scripture, so you look at the context first of Peter's speech and how those words were used, and you can come up with these two meanings, but in the end it didn't matter. Uh, but that's what we got to do, is when you have a difficult passage, we look at the context, and then we look to, to the setting, right? What are the people that are being spoken about or being spoken to, what's their situation? And then ultimately, what does it mean to them? And then what does it mean to us? And they better be the same. Or you did it wrong. And chat count down. In verse 13, mm -hmm. where it says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, the word servant there in this book is, is a small s. And when we look at uh, verse whatever we're looking at. It's a capital S. 26, is it? Is it in yours? That's interesting. Yeah, it's lowercase in the S. Lowercase in the 13 and then in uppercase in the verse yeah. 25. And it is the same word as pedia. It didn't, the word didn't change because you know, there's many words for servant and, and slave and so forth. But pedia, doulos. Uh, but anyway, it just was interesting that it that, that that's, an, me. that's an editorial thing and well you know. also I think for clarity they, they took it a step further because servant Jesus but Jesus' name isn't mentioned in chap in the verse twenty six. God having raised up his servant, which servant? Sent him to you first. So maybe that's why they Capitalize the yes, S because Jesus isn't there. The word the word Jesus. Jesus is, I, okay, yeah, so it's using it as a proper name or title. Gotcha. That okay, might be. That makes, okay, that could be. Because yeah, I've even noticed inconsistencies sometimes in the Psalms. You know, you'll have Lord, 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 and you'll have <laughs> yeah. they'll be all capitals, but then there'll be one Lord that's not. Yeah. You're like, why? Then you look at it. Well, is it is it a messianic term, or are they just talking about like the title of status in society? And sometimes it's like it, I don't see how that's any different than all the others. In fact, it's next Sunday's intro. It does it? I think you have one Lord that's not all capitals. And it's like, but it's it's a messianic term. But that, but that comes from uh, did they use the, the the unspoken name of God in the original? And, and that's where that comes from. And if they just use the word Lord, Kyrios, in Greek, uh, they don't do it all capitals. But if they use Yahweh, then that's, right, then they do all capitals, Lord, and that's what that stands out for. But sometimes just reading in English, you look at that and go, why is that any different from any other use of the word Lord in this psalm? So, yeah, anyway. Okay, that's chapter three. Questions? Comments? Well, some of these early chapters, it's going to be a lot more of we're going to we're going to kind of talk about it and what do you think and how do we how do we read this uh, instead of just me yammering on for an hour because I'm doing something different for once. And it's kind of fun because a lot of these are speeches, so you put yourself in the audience hearing the speech. And then, yeah, next week we will get into the setting. So next week's four. And then, I don't, yeah, we'll have class next week. Like, just remember, I'll be out of town Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday because I'm at the Ohio District Conference. Uh, so that'll be fun. Uh, but chapter four, we're going to start setting into some of these social situations where you see, like, oh, that's kind of weird. <laughs> like, would we do that today? Uh, when you when you say people talk about they gave everything they had and they all distributed equally, it's like communism in the Bible, socialism in the Bible, uh, which some people actually use this for that. It's like, see, they were socialists; they you know shared everything equally. And That's look what happened when you didn't. It's interesting that the first of the virtues of the early church was giving. Hmm. Yeah, like sharing, sharing as sharing, they had. Giving, sharing. Which I mean, Judaism taught it. Jesus reinforced it. You know, if you have two tunics, give the other one to somebody else. You know, can't wear two at once. Uh, 
Yeah, and then the early church took it to heart. And then we're going to have weird stories about why, why, well, okay, yeah, we get that they did that, but is that fair? Is that right? Yeah, so we'll get into some of the, some of the strangeness is going to be beginning. You know, so we'll see Ananias and Sapphira, and then the story of Stephen, and then Philip, and then you know, first evil introduction to Saul, and then Philip, and then, yeah, Philip, and then we'll start getting into Paul. And then Peter and Paul getting into it. Yeah. Okay. So that's where we'll pick up next time. I just think it's neat that the early church, that's what's so interesting about the book of Acts, is, you know, the early, they don't hide any of, normally, why would you publish, like, Peter and, and, and Paul getting into it? Like, no. like, why would that, why are you making that public? Not only public, but it's like, Literally scripture now. It's like normally you wouldn't. It's like let's not talk that's about human that. nature. You right. know what we do that. Right. Exactly. You know, and that's why that stuff's included. I mean, other than it was also important, it showed you know, hey, Peter wasn't perfect. Peter wasn't pope. But well, you know, Jesus calling people dead to right. thieves and robbers and fools and yeah. getting Isn't frustrated by like, didn't you don't remember? Did Peter? you not? Yeah. You know, yeah. do you not yeah. read? Cut off the. Yeah. Ear. yeah, and he only cut off his ear because he missed. So that was, that's a killing blow. Because that's that's a killing blow to do come like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then your sword gets stuck, and then when you're trying to pull your sword out of the other guy, guy another guy comes up behind you and kills you because mm -hmm. you didn't. Anyway, sword fighting. Uh, yeah, so that's one of the interesting things about Acts is it shows you like warts and all the early church, you know, and shows how. You know, even the leaders were human, very human. Uh, which, when they start getting martyred, is makes them even more human. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of interesting things in this book that you don't get a taste of anywhere else, really, uh, in any narration. Uh, so we'll be getting into some of that, and we'll start seeing some of these social ideas that are a little foreign to us, and we'll start seeing them come out. Uh, which goes back to the point I was making originally when we're trying to interpret the Bible. There's a couple things we have to make sure we do, and that is context is important. You have to look at not only who in the story, what, what they were hearing and seeing, but you also have to look at who in the early church was receiving this text, what they were listening to, for example, in the Gospels. Uh, like Jesus doing his bread of life discourse in John chapter six, you not only have to look at what the people there when Jesus said those words were thinking, but what was the early church thinking when they first heard this gospel? And then also what do we make of it today? And they should try to all match uh, because otherwise we're reading something into it. We're reading our cultural biases into it, or we read our society into it. Um, and we can't do that. It has to mean for them 2,000 years ago what it means to us today. Or what it means to us today has to mean what it meant to them 2,000 years ago. Because the Word of God doesn't change. The meaning of the Word of God doesn't change. So if we adjust it for us, what does it mean to us today? It better mean what it meant back then too or you're doing it wrong. So that's our check. Uh, which sometimes people are not so careful with and then we get in trouble. So that's where we'll stop this week, and we'll pick it up next week. Community in the early church in Acts chapter 4.